Welcome to Cinema in the Age of Ideology, a series in which we will explore the greatest films of the greatest ideologies of the 20th century. Beyond propaganda itself, how does cinema as an art form manifest the ideology in which it is circumscribed? This is communism and Eisenstein, this is National Socialism and Riefenstahl, this is Cinema in the Age of Ideology. Welcome back to Cinema in the Age of Ideology, to our second episode of the second cycle, <laughs> National Socialist Cinema. Previously we reviewed Hans Steinhoff's Hitler Junge Quex. Today we're going to analyze Franz Wenzler's Hans Westmar, a German destiny from the year 1929. Another martyr film from 1933, the year of the rise of power for the Nazis. This one dwells into the institution of the Sturmabteilung, or the SA, the brown shirts. As always, I will be joined by my friend Academ Perspective. Hello, thanks for having me on. A film about the street of Berlin. It is a, a film about the struggle that would carry on the Nazi ideal in the years to come. Soviets in Russland, Soviets in Deutschland, Franz Wenzler, as well as our previous Hans Steinhoff, is a director that transitioned into the Nazi regime from the Weimar period. As our previous director, he carries with him the vestiges of the Weimar art form of cinematography, the expressionism and now the realism that we are about to see. Little did we find about this director. Indeed, little information is found about the actors, directors, and sometimes even the production of these films. I would say that it is only naturally that we know sometimes so little about these films. First of all, its popularity even today is not uh, present at all. Secondly, it is the collapse of Germany that happened, unlike the Soviet Union, which, uh, with its Moscow Film School, even now continues to produce its same tradition of films. However, the National Socialist films and the Weimar period production was completely destroyed after the war. It is, in many ways, a tragedy of cinematography in which Franz Wenzler is circumscribed. We must also remember that during the rise of power of the Nazi regime, many of the film directors Germany, uh, of the bourgeois, of the Jewish, of the leftist, simply fled from Germany or were detained and banned, censored or put in jail. It is in this artistic context in which these films, in this 1933 ideological rise, that we find ourselves. The film just like Hitler Junge Quex is a sort of historical movie. It is inspired on the historical character Horst Bessel. I think it is the, one of the most famous names in National Socialism, as he gave the name to the unofficial National Socialist anthem Horst Wessel Lied, or Die Fanne Hoch, as it is known. The film, therefore, is a semi-fictional historic film of this Horst Wessel, who was an SA member and died in a sacrificial, heroic Nazi uh, way in 1930, thus becoming a martyr for the party itself. And indeed, he was going to be the most important martyr of the movement. Without further ado, let's look into Hans Westmar. So the film, and in many ways the life of Horst Wessel, 
begins with his mobilization in the SA in Berlin, in 1920, late 1920s Berlin. Immediately in the film, we are thrown into the life of Hans Westmar, when the character, it seems, feels out of place with the milieu that is 1920s Berlin. A cosmopolitan city, a progressive city, a modern city. Hans Besmar, along with his uh, American friends who are visitors to, the, to Germany, visit, for example, a nightclub where, for example, uh, patriotic songs are vulgarized for the bourgeois and the nightclub life. Hans Besmar is uh, immediately disgusted by this and he simply leaves in anger, making a scene, so to speak. Ich kann nicht hier bleiben, Mut. Ich kann wirklich nicht. Nur eines sollen Sie wissen. Das da, das ist nicht Deutschland. Deutschland, glauben Sie mir, Mut. Deutschland, das ist ganz woanders. We are shown that he is a student of medicine, and here again we are shown that he isn't altogether fitting with the uh, with the teachings or the, even the political inclinations that the teachers have. He's simply out of place in the society. We also see a little of the life of Hans Besmar as a SA, that is a Sturmabteilung member, the paramilitary organization of the National Socialist Party. However, during the late 1920s, this organization is at the front of the party, organizing the street manifestations, the demonstrations and the placing of propaganda. It is also a turbulent time in the 1920s Germany. During the Republic, it was notorious the political instability between the left and the right. And here in this film, we are shown this political instability. Hans Vesmar, as uh, a leading member of the SA, is invited by the socialists to have dialogue with them. But this demonstration of dialogue and speech and understanding immediately decays into a brawl. The film thus progresses and we are shown both sides of, let us say, the enemies who are the Communist Party members, the leaders of the Communist Party, and Hans Besmar and how he organizes the Sturmabteilung. We are shown that the leaders of the Communist Party start intriguing on how to overcome Hans Besmar and his leadership of the SA, who are gaining ground on the streets of Berlin. By ways of intrigue, blackmail and shady practices, the Communist Party organizes its opposition to the SA in every demonstration on the street. The, S, the Communist Party, in one scene, completely changes the newspaper to misinterpret the facts of a National Socialist demonstration and making it appear that the National Socialists shot an innocent people watching the demonstration. The struggle continues throughout the film and in one moment Hans Vesmar simply decides that he must join the workers and abandon his life of uh, bourgeois uh, status and his studies on medicine and simply work on a factory with the other people, saying that one must be a worker to understand the workers and thus gain their hearts to become national socialists themselves. We thus see Hans Vesmar suddenly working as a taxi driver, then as a factory worker. My place is here. Ja, sehen Sie, Mut. Wir sind nur ein kleines Häuflein. Aber wir bringen eine große Botschaft für alle. Deswegen ist aus dem Student ein Chauffeur geworden? Jawohl. Wir müssen nämlich tief hinein in die Massen. Müssen sein wie Sie. Arbeiten wie Sie. Und dann werden wir schaffen. Wie lange? Ein paar Jahre. All the while, the communist leaders are in the shady practices blackmailing people close to Hans Besmar to know his whereabouts, to know what he is doing, to even try to bribe him. However, Hans Vesmar resists these practices with uh, what it seems unwavering moral integrity. There is a girl in the Communist Party who is 
ordered by the leaders of the party to sway Hans Vesmar in a lewd manner into the party and out of his affiliation of, to the National Socialism. This girl called Agnes, however, falls for Hans Vesmar and tells him of the plot against his life and against the movement itself. The communist leaders become progressively more and more desperate on their intents of ending Hans Vesmar, of getting rid of himself, because he simply cannot be swayed by the usual manners. So they resort to the last measure possible, which is murder. In one scene, thus, they try to murder him. However, after Hans Vesmar is shot, he survives the assassination attempt. And the leaders of the Schumachteilung advise Hans Vesmar to simply leave Berlin for his safety and go to Pomerania to organize the SA. However, Hans refuses, clinging to his patriotism and to his faith on the National Socialist Movement. He stays in uh, Berlin and continues with his demonstrations and the organization of the Sturmabteilung. However, another assassination attempt occurs. Hans Besmar becomes careless and he also starts falling for his lady Agnes. The second assassination attempt succeeds this time. He's shot in the face. However, he doesn't die immediately again. He's reduced to a hospital bed where he is agonizing for his life, but still his fate seems unwavering. The SA who he organized are completely loyal to him and pay him homage to in the hospital. And then in, in the hospital itself, the communists try to put the, the final nail in the coffin and kill him for good. However, the, the SA loyal to Hans Vesmar prevent this. Nevertheless, Hans Vesmar is too weak from his wounds and dies. The film does not end at that moment, for we see the loyal SA enshrining Hans Vesmar despite the political ban by the government to make a, st a sort of political funeral for Hans Vesmar, a party funeral for Hans Vesmar. And they make a funerary procession along the street in which we see all the chaos of the communists trying to, to attack the coffin and the procession. And the film ends with this funeral that magnifies itself into the movement and the SA marching to the streets of Berlin in victory. Thus ending the film, so we can begin our analysis. I would like to mention uh, how there was a, a rather odd and very eerie similarity to uh, the communists and three famous uh, Soviets, which were Lenin, uh, Trotsky, and Stalin. Uh, I don't know if you might have caught that too. The <laughs> I think so. The Paul Vevegna, which is the one that looks like a Mongol, is supposedly yeah. supposedly to be Stalin, right? And then no, 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 that's supposed to be that's that's that, he looks more like Lenin. And then there's ah, okay. the and then there's the old guy with the wacky hair and, and shades. Yeah, the, su the super Jew. Like, is yeah, Trotsky. super Jew. Trotsky. But then there's the guy who was moral, but he had a big mustache and his hair slicked back. Uh, he uh -huh. looked a bit more like Stalin. Now uh, I, 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 didn't, at the time. I didn't notice that. I did think immediately that the old guy was Trotsky, <laughs> Trotskyite, yeah. and a Jew, a total Jew. Uh, well, it seems that um, the women rather play a, a backgroundish kind of role, except for, of course, uh, Agnes, who's uh, 
abused uh, by the Communist Party uh, to the point where she uh, prefers uh, suicide, uh, which goes to show the, the rather infectious and rather uh, dangerous uh, hold that the Communists uh, grasp uh, within uh, the soul of the individual or the, of the German folk. And it's interesting that uh, in the film they uh, place a hard emphasis on um, the the corruption and the degeneracy of the Weimar uh, Republic. Uh, for instance, there's a there's a good scene where uh, Westmar is uh, is acts as a tour guide for an American uh, visiting Germany, who's actually, I believe, uh, of German descent, and. Uh, the, the, the visitor, he's shocked by how much Berlin has changed and everything is so unfamiliar to him and everything that's sold, uh, like for instance, he wants uh, traditional German beer, but all they, but he becomes infuriated finding out that uh, not only that the bar he would always go to you know, when he was younger uh, was totally changed and renovated to some sort of uh, swinging uh, club. Uh, uh, jazz club, uh, but also that, uh, uh, and, uh, and most of the workers there are of non-German descent, usually blacks, and the music being played isn't German music, uh, and and the, the even the beer being served isn't even German beer, uh, and this uh, I think was very effective in regards to uh, how it. How the film was trying to convince uh, and portray uh, the the downfall or the the, the downfall in state of Germany uh, at that time. Uh, yes, uh, the the film uh, works for, uh, very nice on that aspect because, uh, for example, there's one in that scene uh, just a moment before that scene. There's a shot of the characters, a close shot. Um, a first plane, I think it's called. A first plane of the characters on the taxi, and they are looking to the windows. And we have superimposed the images of the signs of the businesses, and we actually see what kind of bus businesses uh, they are looking at. Uh, I mean, it is making us an image of the street, and we see all these neon signs. This. Uh, bars with uh, foreign names, with eccentric names, or with provocative names. In the context of the film, it is an innovative shot. And it also serves the purpose of the film, which is, which is to show this uh, degeneracy uh, and the, a sort of distance between the characters. Now, I don't know if you pay close attention, but yeah, for example, we, they, when they come into the bar, there's these uh, like pamphlets on the background, on the on the wall of the bar. And for example, it's it says, here sings Ninette uh, from Senegal. So it, it is a, a black woman, which is again, a, an indirect political statement. And then uh, when they get inside on the, on the background, they also see a Jew goes around the world. <laughs> for example, little things that uh, we don't see for more than a second, but they are there. They are, it is the construction of the scenery that is that it is here important. And another thing of this the construction of the scenery is the construction of of the scenery, of course, is uh, the setting. The setting of these films uh, of Hans Besmar, as we are seeing, as well as Hitler Junge Quex, is usually the street of alleys, of departments, of uh, chambers. And when we see shots of the street, the shots are usually um, not on a general plane, are more uh, closed into the build buildings. We don't usually see the sky on these films. And this is an heritage of the Weimar period, of German Expressionism. The usual uh, term is this uh, uh, kaleidoscopic street shot, as it is called. In terror films, for example, we usually get lost on the streets. And here the effect is some, uh, not uh, similar, but analog with this. Now the, the pretended 
purpose of these street shots is to get us down into the grittiness of the street. There's a, so, a sort of, I don't know if you noticed, a sort of dirtiness, a, so, a sort of uncleanness to the shots of the streets. And that's on purpose. They're, they're, they don't look uh, uh, white. They don't look, so, let us say, civilized. We don't see, for example, the Brandenburg Gate. We don't see, for example, white shots of plazas, of, of parks, of, of shots that construct the city into a, I don't know, a home-like or a appealing uh, area. And this construction of the scenery is uh, extremely important. It, it actually helps us get into the psychology of the characters. So, for example, in the Weimar period, the psychology of the characters in the German expressionism, expressionism usually was reduced to, a, to some sort of depression uh, aura, an aura of depression, of, of fear, of confusion. In these films, in which we are living in expressionism, but we, we still see the style, we are entering into realism. And this realism correlates with the purpose of the films. Uh, it is the same thing with the previous film, Hitler Junger Quex, and it is the same thing here with Hans Besma, this grittiness, this down-to-the-earth film. There, there's a sort of claustrophobia to them. The most important thing of, in these films, and this is true of, 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 of these both films, and also another 1933 film called Es a Mann Brand, is the shots in insights. The shots in insights are the most important of these films, of this sort of realism. And the first thing we must say about these uh, shots in the interiors is the work with the shadows. For example, we see a scene with the, when the communists are plotting their next move against Hans Vesmar, and it is a, an obscure chamber, only illuminated by a lamplight. So we we see a contrast of shadows where we see everything blackened but their faces are enlightened you see that their expressions contrasted uh, with this limited lightning and it's extremely well done uh, by the germans let, let us not say simply on this film but by the germans in general this uh chiaroscuro so to speak is well done here <laughs> This uh, mechanism of interiors also works for uh, the plot of the film. It is in the interiors where the decisions are made. It is in the interiors where uh, this, the, the will is found to act, to make the move, so to speak. It is, for example, in the interior of the beer halls, of the reunion, reunions of the SA, where Hans Besmar decides he, you know, that he's going to rally, that he's going to organize in a certain way, in the shadiness of the room, that the communists make their shady practices. And then this all disinvolves itself on the street, which is the, let us say, the actualization of the project that was made in the interiors, which is extremely relevant to the art form, to the style of, of these films. The acts, or the let us say, the events that happen on the street are relatively simple. It is usually a demonstration, it is usually a chase, a fight, uh, something of, of the like, or a manifestation of the will in the sort of the political demonstration. Whereas on the interior, it is all personal struggle, it is all decision-making, it is all uh, conscience-changing. So it is interesting how these films are constructed in this interior uh, structure 
representing both the interior structure of the mind, and on the street, the outer structure, representing the outer manifestation uh, of our persons. What can we say about the editing? It is a horridly uh, edited and revised film, of course, due to uh, the censorship of uh, Goebbels, uh, who did not find the film to his fancy. Of course, he clearly wanted the film to be out of, in obscurity because he clearly didn't care about the quality of the editing. Um, so this was due to the censorship at the time. And so there are a lot of scenes which either are too short or sometimes um, oddly placed. Although thankfully, the, the film as a whole uh, does uh, succeed in getting its... Uh, ideological message out, uh, it does suffer from uh, the neglect uh, of the editing process. Yes, but uh, although I would say that this uh, film, despite its uh, horrible editing, is still a, a superior film, in other terms, than Hitler Junger Quest. It is a more complex film. Um, certainly the characters are more developed. <laughs> than in Hitler Junge Quicks. In Hitler Junge Quicks they were extremely simple. Not as simple as in Einstein's, but yet simple. Here, however, the characters are have a little mo more depth. The character of Hans Besmar has a little more uh, development, yet uh, even if he's the hero of the film, he must remain simple to the ideal. But we have a plethora of characters here that actually give more uh, taste to the simple character of Hans Besmar. For example, the American tourist. We see, for example, what they think about Hans Besmar. Uh, for example, the girl Agnes. We, we see her transformation because of her love for Hans Besmar. Uh, we see a member of the Communist Party who starts getting this moral guilt uh, for the ch shady practices of his party. I think his name was Camilo Ross. Camilo Ross. He actually starts to befriend uh, or become sympathetic with Hans Vesmar. And the moment he is killed, uh, Camilo Ross actually abandons the Communist Party and becomes a National Socialist. In a, th There is a really well-made shot in which at the end of the film we actually see a the funerary procession of Hans Besmar transforming itself into a manifestation, I mean, a demonstration of the SA through Berlin uh, with the torches and everything. And we actually, at first, on the side of the street, we see the opposition, the communists, <laughs> who are raising their fists in the communist, uh, which is the communist symbol. If the Roman salute is the fascist symbol, the fist is the communist or the socialist symbol. Uh, salute, I mean. So the, the Camilo Ross actually is raising his fist, but slowly with his eyes on the horizon, he's extending his palm, making it in, suddenly into a into a Roman salute, into a Nazi salute, uh, which I, I thought it was. Uh, I mean, it sounds simple, but considering the development of the character, I think it was well done. Um, uh, certainly, it's definitely one of the most memorable. Uh, I, I think it's probably one of the first, if not the first, great National Socialist propaganda cin cinematic moment. Yes, it is. It is superior to, to that of uh, Hitler Junge Quest. It is certainly superior. Uh, in a way, Hitler Junge Quest is reduced because it is the story about a child. However, here being the story about a man or a, or a young man. Uh, it, it can be more um, universal or more popular. 
more akin to the public. Uh, another interesting uh, aspect of the film is the, and this is only natural to National Socialist, is the casting choice and the construction, physical construction of the characters. It, it is a relevant subject. For example, Hans Besmar. Hans Besmar must be the Aryan stereotype, the Aryan ideal. So he's a very uh, good looking with sharp features in, of his face. This austere Aryan look who, who you know, the, the, the kind of Aryan look that looks very well when it is looking into the horizon, that kind of look. And also the, of course, of course, the, the girls that are close to Hans Besmar must be pretty. <laughs> and on the countryside, the socialists, we see another th aspect of that. They are ugly. <laughs> the communist leader, uh, which is cast by Paul uh, Vevegna, which is a, uh, an actor which we may see later on, a very important German actor at the time, uh, is a very brawny, uh, large man. And he, he's, uh, let us say, ugly and un Aryan. Uh, an Aryan looking. <laughs> so he actually looks like kind of like a Mongol. And um, he's this imposing kind of deformed figure to represent the socialist first uh, or in the first place. In the second place, there is a, there's also this uh, orator, this uh, socialist orator, which is rather Jew looking. <laughs> he's short, his hair is all Eisensteiny. I mean, in the same way like Eisenstein's and Einstein's, <laughs> all messy, with this long nose, with this, uh, you know, sharp, pointy, uh, forward face, little glasses like, like a representation of Trotsky, uh, a, a really interesting dressing or construction of the characters to oppose them physically to each other. They are also opposed in manners. They are also opposed in speech. So we see a very detailed and conscientious construction of all the elements of the film that, are, as we're going to see, are in accord with a specific ideological purpose, which we can then call propaganda purpose. <laughs> so how does this film portray its ideology? Well, it portrays its ideology by setting a clear contrast between the National Socialist and the Communist Party. And now it's very interesting that uh, although the film clearly um, denigrates the appearance and the behaviors of, uh, of, the, of the Communists, it also portrays them as uh, a force to be reckoned with rather than something they can just brush off uh, because they the film, I think the main theme of the film is probably Germany in and of itself rather than uh, the characters who are sort of like the engines and uh, the communists are really concerned with getting control in Germany because in, uh, in, in, early on in the film uh, the leader uh, emphasizes that if they have control in Moscow as well as control in Berlin uh, then will be unstoppable. And since they already had control of Moscow, it's all the more important that they do not have control in Germany. Uh, but we already see them achieve, uh, almost achieving this. And, uh, and so the struggle is very necessary for them. And there's also a hard emphasis on um, the relationship between uh, the common uh, worker of Germany, uh, factory workers, etc., that there's a respect in the National Socialists for the, 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 the worker, the German worker. Whereas for the communists, he is seen, the, the worker, to the communists, is seen as a, as a tool, just a means uh, rather than uh, an end. It, it is with the li little moments, like little, uh, let's say, emanations of, of character, of, uh, of actions, uh, that the characters um, of the socialist characters really antagonize uh, themselves. For example, the they usually cry Moscow, Moscow, <laughs> like 
they their loyalty is not to Germany, nor to German workers, and, uh, which in many cases wasn't, but to the Soviet Union and the Soviet party back in Moscow, which was the leading force behind international communism. Uh, back there was where the internationals uh, were to be organized worldwide. And this is simply true. Uh, we, we, we cannot deny that the huge influence that the, the communists in Moscow had in every communist party around the world. It was really an internationalist effort which is completely in accordance with Marxist uh, ideology. And it, the film places a large focus also on sacrifice. And I think this is going to be a running theme in all of natural, so, natural socialist cinema, that the place for the, for the natural socialist is not for himself or for his well-being, not, or at least not just his well-being, but the well-being of the country, the fatherland, the party, uh, even to Hitler. And there's also an interesting reference uh, a reference to Hitler as being a worker, that uh, because that it was born from the workers, and thus there should there's an inherent respect and duty for uh, the, the the working collective to uh, f to be even more uh, in solidarity with each other. Yes, it is the socialist in the national socialist element that we are seeing in this film. These are things that Hitler himself makes a lot of emphasis in Mein Kampf. Uh, this uh, socialistic feeling to the movement. And we certainly see this in the film with Hans Vesmar, how he simply abandons his rich, privileged life and by himself comes to work on a menial, low-paying job along with everyone else. And it, it actually works for him in the film. He fraternizes with the workers and succeeds in changing their mind. Now, it is also interesting because in the film we see a similar scene for the communist, uh, but in the opposite way. We see the party members, uh, the party leaders of the communism standing above, looking down into a slum. <laughs> uh, a slum uh, district of Germans. These are interesting shots because the shots, one cannot really tell if they are staged or not because the level of poverty, of complete social and economic neglect and decay that was Germany in the 1920s was so astounding, was so enormous that these images that one might think are fictional are really not so. So Im one can simply imagine what the German viewer might have felt or thought when he saw the images of the, of the Germans living in those condition conditions. I mean, these are Germans we are talking about. Uh, supposedly, in this uh, old European jargon, uh, we see a civilized niche, nation, a rich, supposedly rich nation like Germany in this state and nonetheless or more importantly a supposedly open market free market bourgeois and richer na nation in this state it is like a political statement without saying nothing as i was saying it is this contrast between the looking down of the communists and the looking on the same level so to speak that uh, Hans Vesmar has with the workers and in one moment Hans Vesmar is disproving the mi misleading facts of a newspaper be because of course all the Germans are victims of the newspaper <laughs> uh, custom, modern custom and one fellow worker who was who is, we see a, was a fellow communist um, actually says that he was there and that these are lies and he has lost all faith on the communists and becomes a national socialist and helps uh, all the other workers change their mind. I don't know what we could say about this, because in one way, every ideology wants to appropriate truth for themselves. Uh, it is everyone else that is lying. We are telling the truth. We are not really lying on our papers, on our newspapers, on our information, magazines. And so on. I don't know how to interpret this, but I think it is important because in this scene, uh, decadent, 
uh, the communist newspaper is simply disproven and then there is the national socialist figure giving the facts but uh, I, I think I, there is an interpretation that I cannot see right now but I feel it is important <laughs> it's weird mm. it's interesting though that you p pointed out so especially when it comes to information the information must always be in favor of uh, an ideology in order for it to perpetuate its importance and its overall relevance as well as its uh, power over uh, the, the mindset of uh, the masses. So uh, information is always the most important factor in that, uh, especially in conducting uh, the, uh, the society as well as uh, influence on their behavior. It has a very clear understanding of uh, of real politique in regards to the idea of the friend and the enemy, uh, the Schmittian um, contrast. Although it attempts to simplify things, it also gives a very clear and rather complete and gives a sense of wholeness in its propaganda so as to uh, uh, give a place of security for the interpretation. If that makes sense. Yes, but it, for example, when one reads Mein Kampf and how, uh, I mean, it, it, how Hitler speaks of propaganda itself, of inf the sharing or creation of information, uh, uh, he's he actually says that propaganda does not must not serve like the truth, so to speak. Rather, the truth is not intrinsic in the propaganda. The truth does not lie on the newspaper and on the facts that are presented. The truth does not lie on the party slogans. The truth does not lie on what we are actually saying. No, rather, he's saying that the truth lies on the ideals of the movement itself or, or the falseness of those ideals. And then everything is uh, sort of justified. One is justified in lying because our ideals are true. It is a sort of uh, the Machiavellian in the sense of the prince, sort of uh, the ends justify the means uh, in a moral superiority, moral absolutism, so to speak. For for Hitler in Mein Kampf, for the National Socialism, information is not is really not what matters. I mean, of course, propaganda matters enormously. Uh, for Hitler, for Goebbels. Why, why is Goebbels famous for propaganda, of course? But it, it, it is not what gives uh, its strength, uh, its uh, legitimacy. For Hitler, for National Socialism, information is not the legitimacy. And we are actually proven of this in the film. There is a scene when the Hans Vesmar and some uh, National Socialists, SA, are invited to a communist uh, rally, to a communist uh, meeting on a, on a bar, so that they can have a dialogue with their enemies, with their uh, ideological uh, opposi uh, opposition. Uh, <laughs> and we actually, with all rigorosity of the ideology here, the dialogue fails and descends into fist fighting.
this is only necessary for national socialism and even for communism. Communism itself does not believe in dialogue, in, in open dialogue in the bourgeois liberal way. This is simply not so. Uh, and I, I think they can and I think in this way that this endless, uh, I mean, this ideal of the endless dialogue to solve everything in a parliamentary, uh, supposedly, quote unquote, civilized way of through speech alone is an illusion. It is simply not true. <laughs> I think I, we would say that. Uh, it is the failure of dialogue. And what I was getting at, when we see the failure of dialogue, we see the triumph of something else. We see the delegitimization of dialogue, of speech alone, and we see the legitimization, the legitimization and the uh, reinforcement of another idea, the idea of force. Here is what it is most important. It is important, as Hitler says in Mein Kampf, it is important, as Hans Westmark has, says himself in the film. It is force, it is organization, it is struggle, discipline. That is what matters for the National Socialist. It is a complete opposition with the liberal. And actually, it, that puts them on the same level, or relatively on the same level, as the socialist. Both are fighting in the street. The liberal does not want to fight in the street, he wants to speak the problems and solve them. But no, the communist wants the revolution, the socialist one, the National Socialist wants the struggle, and that's the, the really interesting fact of how the three, uh, <laughs> the three ideologies work, uh, let us say, together. How? Because the three ideologies never really coexisted as they did in Germany. The, the, the simply enormous number of socialists that existed in Germany, even from the 19th century, from Bismarck, it's enormous, it's extremely important. Uh, and then, for example, Karl Marx was himself from Germany. He was a Jew, he was not German, <laughs> but he was from Germany. And uh, Lenin came out from Germany. He, I think he was in, in exile in Germany. I, I don't remember well. <laughs> so I, believe it was, uh, I believe it was Switzerland. Uh, maybe Switzerland, uh, pan-Germanism. <laughs> so <laughs> Germany had a very strong, along with France, a very strong socialist uh, block. And then we, we have this Weimar Republic, extremely bourgeois, disgustingly uh, liberal republic of, of democracy, or <laughs> of free markets. And, uh, and then we have the National Socialist, the new movement, of course, the newest movement, ideological movement of the 20th century, rising in Germany, the, the, the most notorious one. So we see this really particular, and this, are, uh, this is a historical uh, moment, a particular uh, historical moment of three ideologies struggling for the fate of a nation. <laughs> and that's, that's uh, actually National Socialist speech, National Socialist dialectic, Deutschland der Bache, uh, Morgan is the Neue Zeit. That's the sort of, uh, of jargon of speech that they use because they are aware of this ideological struggle in Germany. They are extremely aware of this. Actually, I would say that the National Socialists, giving them credit, some credit, are the most aware, aware ideologically. The liberal simply puts aside the communists and the fascists and believes in its speech, in its democracy. So it is really uh, Unpositive, uh, that is negative with its assertion. The communist, however, acknowledges the liberal as the bourgeois in his materialist, historical, and necessary way, and he gives his place after his necessary place after the bourgeois and the liberal ideology, the necessary uh, place to rule the world and free mankind, you know, as the song goes. And then there's the National Socialist. Now, the National Socialist has another historical interpretation of all of this and simply sees a racial healthiness and decay in which liberalism and communism are circumscribed. So they are reduced to a sort of perennial decay, as if communism and liberalism were, a, were only the latest manifestation of racial and moral decay. And that's 
really interesting these differences in ideology in this sort of cosmology in which the man is finds himself yeah in fact uh, Carl Schmitt summed up liberalism the failure of liberalism perfectly in that regard where he says that and I quote the essence of liberalism is negotiation which is a cautious half measure in the hope that the definitive dispute the decisive battle can be transformed into a seemingly parliamentary debate and permit the decision to be suspended forever in an everlasting discussion <laughs> i think this is a, a brilliant and oftentimes this quote is used <laughs> oftentimes this quote is, yes this quote is often used by liberals themselves uh, as a sort of uh, a proud definition of it when in fact it's a rather denigrating um, uh, <laughs> uh, conclusion from schmidt and again going back to the to this failure of dialogue and triumph of the force or later of the will we see this constructed into the film very well where there is a, a considerable number of scenes on the street which are solely uh, on the subject of of demonstration of manifestation of rally and of fighting uh, of you know street struggle and this is really important because the the this is these scenes are short comparing to the other actors or the characters are speaking with other characters but here where we see a lack of speech where we see a lack of dialogue of development we only see the more uh, basic the more rough the more uh, animalistic uh, forces em uh, manifesting themselves on the street which is the necessary milieu in which they must manifest themselves in which in which the phenomenon of the force must come to be these shots are extremely well done it, the, these are shots of hundreds of people. Uh, I don't know how they are organized, but the way the extras and the actors are told to move and how to make this chaos is extremely well done. If you pay, pay close attention to how they made those mass scenes, you can see that they put a lot of work into them. That they put a lot of work into how uh, people uh, looked at the demonstrators, how people reacted, how people fled, how people fought, how the SA marched, how what they chanted, of course. The if you pay close attention, the usual motto of the SA is Deutschland erwache or Deutschland uh, awaken or awake in the imperative. So the the, the the SA saying this, and then we see the communists, the, the socialists demonstrating. Uh, singing the international so it is really this well done coming or clashing of forces of basic forces in the last very last scene where Bessemar's martyrdom is celebrated and respected shows to the natural socialists that you do matter as an individual uh, for the collective uh, and this is uh, like I said and believe in the previous video that uh, th this is national socialism's strongest uh, uh, success that it managed to in other words succeed in merging the collective with the individual uh, in other words that they did not see uh, a dilemma between them they saw a rather harmony with them uh, and this is a rather very uniquely German uh, view on it which uh, gives National Socialism an even stronger point in regards to its nationalism uh, because a lot of its philosophy is pretty much strictly German. It doesn't come from any foreign um, influence, of course, aside from maybe uh, fascism, but only in regards to its inspiration rather than its influence. So that gives it uh, a good, strong German end uh, and a sort of recognition of the German identity and the Volk. In which Hitler, in, in which Hitler would uh, always write about, especially in Mein Kampf. Yes, it is something that even Alfred Rosenberg mentions on his book, The Myth of the Twentieth Century. Uh, he says, in a moment, that individualism and this uh, 
development of the individual by himself is something Aryan. I mean, of course, in Rosenberg, it is strictly Aryan. We see this in Rosenberg. And also it is interesting because we can also say this in uh, Protestantism. One could make the claim that really Protestantism uh, fell with the soul of the German. I mean, I don't believe it is accidental that certain nations became Protestant and certain others did not. For example, <laughs> all the northern <clears throat> Germanic nations became Protestant. Britain, Germany, uh, majoritarily, of course, Switzerland, uh, except Austria, uh, Denmark, all, all Scandinavia, all, and of course the Frisons, uh, Holland and Belgium to a certain extent, became Protestant. And of course we are not uh, communists to deny race, or, or even, or not necessarily race in the materialist sense, but ethnicity. And we can make the claim that it is something in Protestantism and in, in its individualism, in its focus on work, that is akin to the Germanic, to the to the German. Um, it is some. It is a really interesting uh, observation that the only thing Hitler does, I think, in Mein Kampf was to criticize super individualism. You see, he doesn't criticize individualism. He uses the term super individualism, like there is an excess individualism, but individualism is okay and it is German. Because in the National Socialist way, everything that is good is Aryan, <laughs> of course. That concludes our analysis on the ideological and cinematic relevance of Hans Westmark. I hope you enjoyed it. Now, for our next film that we will be analyzing is The Citizen Kane, what is con ought to consider to be the, C the Citizen Kane of natural socialist cinema. And you've guessed it, it is Lenny Riefenstahl's uh, Triumph of the Will. So stay tuned for that. Until next time.